It's getting ready. It's mm -hmm. gonna work. Yes, and looks like we're coming up live here and we'll just wait for some people to join. Uh, there's a notification just went up that Colorado Gifted is live. Welcome everybody. We'll get started in just a couple minutes. Thanks for joining us. Hope everybody had a great vacation day. I think that's one of my favorite vacation days as a teacher, that, that bonus Monday at the start of the school year, just when you need it most. And the weather is almost always gorgeous here in Colorado at that time. And so, uh, Hope everybody else had that kind of experience. Welcome everybody, we've got a nice group here. And I think uh, since we've got so many already that I'm gonna go ahead and get us kicked off here. And um, welcome to Conversations with CAGT. And uh, we've got Leon Garber with us tonight, but I wanna run through a few announcements to get us started. The Colorado Association for Gifted and Talented supports gifted and talented in many ways including legislative advocacy, providing monthly information and resources through our electronic publications, recognition of con outstanding contributors to gifted education from students to teachers, to parents and administrators, and supporting mentorships for teachers new to the profession. We host a legislative day uh, each, uh, each year in the winter where students come to the state capitol and get to partake in the process of legislation and even get to shadow some of our state legislators. Each year we have a conference though, this year we will not have uh, a state conference because the National Association for Gifted Children is coming to Arvada and we're helping NAGC host their national conference here this year. And if you're interested, uh, if you're a parent out there, there is a, there's a dedicated parent day on Saturday and of course, everybody else, you know, uh, take a look at that. Uh, we're excited to be hosting that this year. And we're also happy to bring you this fantastic lineup of speakers each Tuesday. And you may want to consider becoming a member or making a one-time contribution, of course. And as the president elect of this organization, I have to mention, go ahead and contribute. And we will gladly take that contribution, but membership does bring some nice perks with it. And for more information, including a full list of member benefits, you can visit www.coloradogifted.org. Now I'm going to start the recording. Remember that you can find this event from coloradogifted.org. And if you go there and you click on the resources banner, you'll find recordings of all of our conversations with CAGT, including those from last year. Welcome everybody to Existential Thinking and Giftedness. Our guest is Leon Garber, and he's a philosophical writer contemplating and elucidating the deep recesses of man's soul. He's a licensed mental health counselor and psychotherapist specializing in existential psychotherapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, and trauma therapy, and manages a blog exploring issues of death, self-esteem, love, freedom, life meaning, and mental health and mental illness from both empirical and personal viewpoints. Uh, we're going to have a, conversa a true conversation with Leon tonight. So I would uh, encourage everybody to drop your questions into the chat as we come along because uh, Leon's open into just kind of freewheeling it with us here tonight. And so Leon, welcome, thanks for coming. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me, Mark. And yeah, I'm not a big fan of presentations, so I'm glad that you were open to this. Yeah, and well, uh, it's going to be fun. I think you guys are in for a treat. Uh, I heard Leon on another podcast, and I thought we've got to get this guy on Colorado Gifted. And uh, because so many of our gifted kids are existential thinkers, and I don't know whether that's by nature or whatever, but let's how would you define existential thinking? Yeah, so great question. 
existential thinking is essentially defined by what are called these ultimate givens of existence. So when you think about ultimate givens of existence, just think about these things or these aspects or these circumstances of life that all human beings have to deal with. So we have death, the fact that we're all mortal and we have to deal with the fact that we do deteriorate and obviously die someday. Uh, it has to do with meaning and the fact that there's kind of a lack thereof, right? Especially objectively speaking, and that essentially life calls to us to create a blueprint for it for kind of each of our individual lives and collectively speaking in terms of creating a society that's sustainable obviously of itself and for future generations for posterity we're also thinking about isolation and the fact that there's this barrier between you and i the fact that unfortunately as close as we can be emotionally um kind of psychologically you know in terms of friendships in terms of our uh, kind of the intimacy within it there will always be a barrier between you and i and i will have to in some sense experience life on my own and just like i was kind of born on my own right in some sense i will also have to die and pass away on my own so when we're talking about that, and then also I would add existential freedom, right? And that's kind of tied into the meaning, right? The fact that you're, again, there's no blueprint and the fact that you have to create this sort of purpose for yourself and you have to figure out what life is going to be. Not really on your own because you can definitely get help with it and you could definitely have dialogues with people, especially with people who've made their own mistakes and they can kind of tell you where they went wrong and some of the kind of errors of their lives and you know why you, you probably shouldn't make some of those decisions. But the point is with these ultimates of existence, with death, meaning isolation and freedom, we're sort of left to contend with them on our own fundamentally. So how does this play out in younger kids? Yeah, so great question too. Um, so with children, what you often see is that they have all of these different questions about the purpose of life and about death, like why do people die? And sort of like, you know, how do I know what I'm supposed to do with my life? How do I know what to be when I grow up? So a lot of times, and I know you and I have talked about this, obviously, from my perspective, and personally, when I was a kid, I would frequently ask my mom, like, how do I know I'm making good decisions? Like, how do I know that mm. I like what I want to do with my life is the right thing to do? Uh, why do we have to die? Right? I don't get it. Like, why is why is there death all around? Why do animals die? Why do insects die? Why am I going to die? Um, and then we're also thinking about like um, in terms of uh, what was the other one? Oh, isolation. That wasn't one that I necessarily focused on as a kid. But I mean, there was a sense of loneliness, you know, maybe for various reasons. But I was aware of existential isolation. So even though I was able to articulate the other dimensions of existential thinking and, you know, ask a million questions, I actually wasn't aware of or at least, you know, conscious of or cognizant of existential isolation. But the other ones I find, I mean, maybe you tell me, Mark, if this is your experience as well, that I find a lot of times kids tend to think about it and they think about it in sort of in the terms that an adult would think about it, asking these questions that I feel as though adults most of the time kind of uh, avoid or sort of put out of mind. Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting question. I'm glad you threw it back to me um, because I've taught gifted kids for a long, long time. And I think oftentimes, and you talk about this isolation, that they're not necessarily aware that they think differently from other kids. And I would just, in my own experience, I'm not sure that I really understood that until I was an adult that I thought differently from others. Um, and so I think with gifted kids, one of the really important things is that we help close that gap in, in, and, and that feeling of isolation. Is, is, there a, is there a way to close that gap through through dialogue or things like that. Yeah. So what was really helpful for me was really just conversations that I ended up having with my mom. So, um, and I mentioned this on Emily's podcast. So my mom and I disagree significantly on spiritual views. Um, so I'm not religious at all, nor do I consider myself to be spiritual, but she is. So we spoke heavily about reincarnation. What does that mean? What does an afterlife look like? Uh, we spoke heavily about the meaning of life because reincarnation is tied into that. So the idea is a better person you become, you know, as you kind of go on through uh, like these stages of life, you essentially develop into let's say different types of existences and better existences. So um, even though I don't believe in that necessarily now, what was helpful was the fact that she was willing to go there with me because at that time, like I still have a ton of existential anxiety, but at that time I would say I had a lot more. So just having a person who seemed like, you know, they kind of knew what they were talking about and had strong beliefs that was really helpful for me. And I don't think the beliefs themselves were important, especially for a kid. I don't think it really matters whether there's a God or not necessarily, but I do think it's important that an adult is willing to talk to them about these difficult issues, especially when it comes to something like death, because for me, death was terrifying, right? I didn't understand how a person's psyche could be there one minute and then just gone the next. 
So, I mean, obviously the theory of reincarnation gave me an explanation for it, which again, I don't necessarily agree with today, but it was helpful to get an understanding and to actually, so for me, the way I look at it is that was a step in the sort of right direction to dealing with these issues. It might have necessarily been the right answer, but the fact that my parent was there willing to talk to me about these things and give me some sort of guidance was really helpful. It sounds like what you're part of what you're saying is just as a parent or as a teacher, for example, uh, just being being willing to listen, but also knowing at the same time that you don't have to have the answers to those questions. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Or, or even if you do have the answers to that questions, or you think you do have like the answers to those questions, I also think that that could be helpful because honestly, even if you have existential anxiety in let's say a Christian household or like you know. A, let's say a Muslim household, I think that's still really helpful, even if, again, necessarily, you don't necessarily agree with the same views when you get older. So yeah, open-mindedness could be really great too. If a person says, hey, you know what, we all have to go through these existential sort of, um, I guess, givens or like these circumstances together. And that's also really helpful to say like, hey, I don't know the answer, but like really nobody does, right? We all kind of are sort of, we throw our hands up and we wonder what's going to happen after this, if there is an after this, but we, we don't know the answer. But the thing is like, we're all in this together. So that could be helpful too. Just knowing that even if let's say somebody is uncertain about what will happen to you and what that means, it's nice to know that somebody else feels the same exact way as you do. So it's just, uh, it's just the notion of like, we're going through this together. And then, yeah, I'm scared too. I always like that as well. Well, the idea of like, yeah, yeah, no, I know, I get it. I'm scared too. I'm the adult and I'm terrified of these things as well. I think that's really helpful too, where the idea is that like, there's some sort of commonality within the existential drive, that it's not just you, the kid who's overreacting, but everybody feels this way. Or most people feel this way, at least when they think about it. Is there, is there a point where those questions might, is, are, they, are those sorts of questions from your child something to be alarmed about? Okay, so great question, right? So now we're looking at the distinction between existential thinking and sort of philosophizing and depression. So I want to be really careful in saying what I'm about to say. So yes, I am a, a clinical specialist, but I also obviously can't predict depression in every single form. So I can't really know whether or not somebody is depressed, especially you know, when we're talking in hypotheticals. So when then saying that and kind of giving that prelude, I would say the thing that you would ask your son or daughter or um, you know, non-binary child is that you would essentially ask them, okay, like, so how come you're thinking about these things? Uh, how come this has all of a sudden become so important to you? And then the person, it, you know, we kind of go into different forms of thinking, right? So if we're thinking nihilism, uh, nothing has meaning, the world is kind of pointless, no matter what I do, it's never going to matter. That's a significant sign of depression. So nihilism and depression are heavily correlated. It's very hard to be a nihilist and not be depressed, even though there have been books written on how that's possible. There's a book called uh, Cheerful Nihilism, even though I, I know somebody who is friends with the person who read that book and he's, at, he's like, he's not so cheerful. So, so but usually if you look at studies, there's a correlation between depression and depressive symptoms and nihilistic thinking. So nihilistic thinking like in itself, that is a huge red flag for depression. But let's say you're going a step further and there is no nihilistic thinking. Let's say the kid says something like, well, I'm just really interested, right? So I was placed into this world and I don't really understand how or why I'm here. What's like, who did this? Who put me here, right? Um, and then, you know, you could kind of ask, you could say, well, how does that make you feel? And they would say, oh, well, maybe confused or curious, or I don't know, this feels weird, right? Like, why are we here? That's great. Because the thing is, what they're doing is they're keeping it on, on an intellectual level and they haven't formed any opinions. So with depression, think of it in terms of again when we come when we come back to the thinking of um, the thinking pattern of nihilism we're thinking about formed beliefs already so they're already saying life is pointless this is stupid uh let's say there is no god religion is dumb whatever it is right so that's already pretty bad because they have already formed their beliefs and they seem kind of hopeless and hopelessness is another red flag to look out for but if a kid is just curious, so, um, and this is a story that I told you, Mark, right? So literally in graduate school, I took this like incredibly long personality inventory and was, they asked the same question in several forms. And the question was something like, do you think of death as a sweet release? And then I answered yes. And so my professor came up to me and he said like, hey man, is everything okay? And I said, yeah, what do you mean? And he's like, did you see the results of the inventory? Like you scored high in suicidality. So I had to kind of explain to him and I said, okay, 
um, no. So the reason why is because I didn't score high in hopelessness. And I also didn't score high in sort of like, uh, I guess, negativistic or cynical thinking. That's another important red flag, cynical thinking, which, I mean, I guess you could look at it in terms of uh, nihilism too. It's very similar, if not the same. So for me, the idea was I was actually more, uh, well, I was definitely more curious, but then when I think of death as a sweet release, the way I'm thinking of it as, well, yeah, I mean, of course it is intellectually because you're disassociated from pain. So of course it's a sweet release. I'm not saying I want it. I didn't say, oh yeah, great. Like this is the thing I'm looking forward to most. I'm just saying if the person is suffering, especially as people get older, I mean, yeah, death is a sweet release. So I think that when we're talking about depression and obviously potentially suicidality, we have to be really curious and ask these important questions. So we have to ask, you know, the, the child in this case, uh, is there kind of like, well, ask ourselves, is there nihilistic thinking? Um, then we would ask the child like, yeah, like what does this mean to you? Um, so th does this make you sad? Um, does it, is there anything else on top of curiosity or confusion? Um, are you feeling hopeless? So we're pretty much looking for cynicism, nihilism, uh, hopelessness, and whatever you're not one. Yeah, so I mean, those are the only ones I could think of. I mean, there are definitely more. And obviously, if these red flags kind of come up, the idea is you would pretty much you would schedule an appointment for an intake session for a therapist or I mean, a psychiatrist, either route is fine. But yeah, but the idea is you're looking at pretty much you, oh, and behavior. Behavior is really important, too. So if they're acting out and if they're especially if they're feeling down and depressed a lot of the time, they're kind of like, oh, you know, like, wow, like this really sucks. Or, you know, how, why, why are we alive? I didn't really ask for this, right? Again, that sense of hopelessness, but you kind of see it in their sort of in their gestures. Uh, you see it in maybe a lack of activity. So these are all things to look out for. Uh, you wrote a blog, the title is, why should I continue to hope? You were talking yep. about hopelessness there for a while. And um, that drew me immediately because we're living in pretty scary times. But uh, can, can you talk a little bit about that? Why should I continue to hope? Yeah, absolutely. So this is actually a revelation that I had in one of my sessions with my clients. So um, she says to me, she says, well, you know what? I'm so tired of dating like all of these people and getting my hopes up, right? She's like, I'd rather not kind of get my hopes up at all anymore. And so as her and I were talking, we, I don't remember exactly like how it kind of came about, but as her and I were talking, we kind of both came to the conclusion that the joy is actually in the hope. So as, as you know, sometimes as silly as it might sound, um, if you've ever seen the movie Rudy about obviously the famous fighting Irish, yeah, Rudy Rudiger, right? So there was this great line in the movie. It was something along the lines of like, hope is the only thing that makes life worth living. So the question is why, right? Why is fantasy or fantastical thinking so important? And the idea is because if you think about life and sort of the things that come into fruition and sort of the things that manifest, they're not that great, right? They're, they're good. They're nice. They're not that great. So it's a good and a bad thing. So if we're thinking about hope just in itself, and we're thinking about hope per se, the idea there is that hope makes you feel good, right? Hope sort of enhances your well-being. It enhances your motivation. It makes you strive for things while at the same time already enjoying the fruits of your labor in some sense, because you're already envisioning them. So the misconception that sometimes people have of dopamine, and this is, I think, a really important point, I think that people often think that dopamine is actually the result of the reward. It's not. So dopamine is actually the expectation of the reward, which is linked to hope. So if you think about it, there's really no dopamine without the hope because the dopamine and the hope are intertwined, right? So, I mean, you could certainly feel great about the reward, but the point of the matter is that if you're looking at the reward in kind of in context with the hope or in comparison with the hope, the hope is always better. So the anticipation of the reward is always better than the reward, right? So what does that mean? Going back into cynicism, if we're thinking of things cynically and we say, well, you know what? Nothing is as good as it seems to be. That's a terrible way of thinking. So why? Because it, first of all, nothing, you're right, right? Nothing is as good as it, as it seems to be. But should that stop us from hoping? Should that stop us from enjoying some of those things? I would say no, because you're only looking at it in a black and white way. You're saying that, well, if things aren't as good as they seem to be, then I don't want them at all. So it's like they have to live up to my standard or they don't live up to my standard. It's sort of like you're telling the universe that it owes you the same experience that you're hoping for. But my question in that case would be why? So why do you need it? Because you've already had all of this joy, you know, the sort of the dopamine receptors going off while you were hoping. And then you have this good experience. Again, not great, but okay, who cares? It's still a good experience. And then you move on, right? So you may move on to hoping for something else. And then you're motivated to do something else. So why would life owe you something more than what you already have? Why does an experience have to meet your expectations in order for you to feel happy with it? So for me, my thinking is whenever I think of joy and whenever I think of hope, oftentimes it's in fantasy. So it's, let's say when I meet somebody, when I meet a new person, 
person and I'm dating them. And I'm like, oh my God, wow, this person is so amazing. And I think about a future together, right? even if it doesn't work out, right? And then I think about a job or a particular position or just an opportunity, uh, the podcast that I have with my friend. And we think about some of the guests that we have. So the shows are good, they're fun, but is it like as amazing as my mind makes it out to be? No, but the thing is the hope and the in beforehand, that's the thing I most look forward to, especially when it comes to, so my podcast partner name is Alan and shout out to him. And so whenever he and I sit there and we talk about like different guests and the different ideas we have for the show, that's honestly the best time I have with anybody ever. Just sitting there and brainstorming and dreaming about what the future would be. And again, going back to that Rudy quote, right? Hope is the only thing, not the only, I don't agree with that, not the only thing. But if hope is one of the main things that make life worth living, yeah, those experiences don't happen without hope. I think you're explaining perfectly why I keep going to the golf course, <laughs> no, no matter how many bad shots I hit, but there, there is that dopamine hit. It's like, I'm going to come out and I'm going to play well. Yeah. Um, I've seen over the years, I've seen gifted kids sort of fall into this trap of this of black and white thinking that you were talking about, um, even to the point that it didn't turn out the way I wanted it or it was less than perfect. And what's the point of continuing? Um, and and I, wanted, I wanna throw this back out here to, to our listeners. We've got a nice crowd out there um, today that are, do you see some of these existential thoughts uh, playing out with your child or with you yourself? And what questions do you have uh, for Leon? It's not every day we, we, we get someone talking to us about existentialism. What a great topic for gifted and talented, um, I, I'm thinking. But do you see these things playing out in, in your own life or in your children's life? And what, what sort of questions might you have? And back to this, this thought about perfectionism. Um, you've, you wrote in your blog about absolute and relative perfectionism. Can you explain more about that? Sure. And this is a topic I love talking about. So the reason why is that I think most perfectionists, I mean, the vast majority, right? So definitely not all. Um, the most perfectionists are what are called absolute perfectionists. So the idea is that I have this set of criteria that I believe is essentially fundamental in every context that I'm in. So let's say, so this is an example I often use. So let's say you're a teacher, right? And so you have different kids who might have different needs, but you know, you have to tailor your, tailor your uh, teaching style to, in some way, right? In some form. So the thing is there, what's going to happen is you're not going to meet all of their needs. So unfortunately, if you're an absolute perfectionist, the idea is that, well, if I don't meet all of my children's or well, you know, my students, um, if I don't meet all of their needs, that means I'm a failure, right? I certainly didn't. So here's my bar. I set the expectation high that I need to make sure that I meet all of my children's needs. So it's like, let's say if they have ADD, if they have, you know, the kind of behavioral disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. No, no, no. It doesn't matter, right? I have to meet everybody's needs. So when we're, when we're thinking of absolute perfectionism, what we're essentially saying is that the person needs to be perfect in every context, with every person, in every situation, always, all the time, ever, right? So that's incredibly hard because that's not how human beings were designed. So I often point to evolution. So if you're thinking about, let's say, domains and contexts, right? And this is where I'm going to get into relative perfectionism or relative perfection to be broad. Um, so let's say if you have sort of evolution, right, which obviously, you know, kind of takes forever, it's on this grand scale, and you have sort of these like, uh, let's say, species evolving, they actually adapt to particular environments. So what that means is that if an animal, you know, or any sort of mammal, if they pretty much if they evolve a coat, right, they're not, that coat is not going to be useful to, to them in every sort of environment. So let's say if it was, uh, if it were an animal in Africa, that quote would be awful, right? It would be, if anything, maladaptive. It would be detrimental to their well-being because if you think about it, they would get tired more easily. Uh, they would sort of be exhausted. I would say probably most of the time, you know, they'd constantly be sweating. They'd feel like crap most of the time. And the idea is they would be kind of like, uh, they would pretty much be open to prey, way more so than let's say if that animal were out in the cold and had that same type of coat. So why that's important is because we're a part of evolution, whether we like it or not. And so evolution doesn't give us the possibility for absolute perfection because it's a nonsensical term. I would say, if anything, it's an oxymoron, because if we're thinking of perfection, right, perfection is pretty much perfection is pretty much adapting to different environments. So you can't adapt to every single environment at once, which is why it's sort of it's, it defeats itself. So the idea of being perfect, globally speaking, where, you know, if I'm an animal in this context or in that context, I'm always going to be perfect. It just doesn't make any sense, right? We're talking about a contradiction in terms of absolute perfectionism. It just doesn't exist. 
So with relative perfectionism, again, going back to the teaching example, what I'm now asking is how can I make the teacher adapt, right? Or how can I adapt if I am the teacher? So it's like, what, what can I do, right? So I can adapt to, let's say, these kids who might have ADD. And then the idea is that I might teach at a slower pace. And if I teach at a slower pace, unfortunately, you know, maybe some of the other kids don't do well on the test because I'm teaching really slow. I'm not necessarily going through all of the material that I'm supposed to. And even though the kids with ADD do better and perform better, maybe some of the other children don't do well. So all of this is to say that you say, well, let me just kind of backtrack a little bit. So people with ADD obviously need accommodations, right? And I want that to be clear. So just because a kid is struggling in class does not mean that they shouldn't get any help. Obviously, they're supposed to. But what we're talking about is how can a teacher adapt to every single child in the classroom? And I would say it's not possible. Teachers have their own particular strengths and their own sort of teaching styles. And the idea is some teachers are great for, let's say, for, I don't know, let's say ADD or even special needs, right? They're sort of, their teaching styles are very, very good and they're super patient and you know whatever other skills that they may need i'm certainly not an expert in special needs education but then you'll have other teachers who just it doesn't work for them they don't perform well in special needs classes and that's okay too but the idea is if you're a perfectionist you're saying that no no i'm supposed to be able to teach everybody so if we're taking and putting this in my domain the idea is like well i have to work well with every single client which i don't so some clients i'm really great with so because I'm a cognitive behavioral therapist, I love action-oriented therapy. So the idea is if you come to therapy, you have to be ready to work. My clients know this. This is not a secret. You have to work and you're going to do homework, right? That's sort of what you're signing up for because that's what's most helpful. To me, to me, it's not to everybody. So what that means is if I have like, let's say a more passive client, I'll try my best to adapt to them. Unfortunately, most of the time it just doesn't work out well because I just, I don't, I don't have, I guess, the patience for it. And the idea is a lot of times clients aren't looking for somebody to sort of work with them. They're looking for somebody to guide them a little bit, let's say more actively. And I don't do that. I prefer the clients to come, come up with their own answers. I'll give them the questions, but I don't want to give them answers. I don't like doing that. So for me, if I were an absolute perfectionist, I would say, wow, I'm such a failure as a therapist. Like here are these people who need my help and I just don't know what to do with them and I don't know how to help them. But if I were a relative perfectionist, I would pretty much adapt and I would say, well, I could just refer them out. I could refer them to a psychoanalyst or a psychodynamic therapist. So for psycho for psychoanalysis, I mean, I'm not sure how much you listen, you guys, um, the listeners over there know about it. But with psychoanalysis, the idea is that it's actually the client is a little bit more passive and the kind of therapist guides you a little bit more, even though some people would disagree with that because traditional forms of psychoanalysis will have the therapist just completely like stone faced and not saying anything. But no, like modern forms of psychodynamic therapy are a little bit more active where the patient at least initially is a little bit more passive. I don't like that and it doesn't work for me. So when I think about the differences between, uh, when I think about the differences between absolute and relative perfectionists, I often ask my clients to think about it in terms of evolution, right? If you were, let's say, let's say if you were an elephant, right? And, you know, kind of you lived, let's say, um, I know, in like Siberia, right? Do you think that you would have a better chance of adapting than like a woolly mammoth or surviving? Or do you think that the woolly mammoth would survive, right? And can, if we took them and put them in different contexts, right? Who would be the creature to survive? And a lot of the times my clients get that and they're like, wow, yes, I can't be everything at once. And so this isn't to say that you can't specialize in multiple domains or that you can't even be an expert in multiple domains. Obviously, that's a possibility. But the thing is, the way that we're wired and built, first of all, we don't have the environment, meaning we don't have all of the time in the world to pretty much master every single like, concept or subject in the world. And then the other thing is we have responsibilities and we have to survive and we have to take care of other people. So it's not possible to be, a, it's, or at least realistically speaking, it's not possible, possible to be an absolute perfectionist in the way that it's defined. So I would tell people that it's okay to be a perfectionist this, but you have to make sure that you understand what that term means and that you're using it correctly. In your life. It's one of those things, though, that just goes to the heart, right? And and I, I, I think that a gifted kid would get what you're saying, uh, but might not be able to enact that. And that's one of the, I, and maybe that's when you're talking about you have to be willing to learn. You have to be willing to do the work that maybe that's I, like some of the work. Can I add to that? Absolutely. Okay, so let's say he says, well, I just don't know how to enact that, right? So this is another, uh, this is sort of metaphor, I guess, not at all. But um, so I would say, you know, the, you know how like in the films, they have like these, uh, they're sort of caricatures, but it, it's a theme, but it's, it's kind of corny, but I like it. Um, so you would have like an angel on your shoulder and then the devil on your shoulder. 
Right. So it's yeah. So essentially, what I would do is this is where we would get into critical thinking, right? He would say he or she or they obviously um, they would say something like, "Well, you know, I don't know how to enact it. Like, what do I do?" I would say, "Okay, give me your best arguments for each side." Right. So I would say side one, absolute perfection. No, actually, I would do the easier one first. I'd say, "Okay, let's do relative perfection." Right. Why should you act in sort of in that context? Right. Why should you act in a way that indicates that you subscribe to the theory of relative perfection? Right. So they would give me the argument for that. Then I would ask them, "Okay, give me the other side." Why should you act in the way that you should be perfect? Right? Why should you beat yourself up every single time you can't adapt or every single time you fail, every single time that you're not good enough? Or, I'm sorry, not even good every single, every single time that you're not perfect all the time, right? Whenever you have some sort of, like, say, let's say, downfall, mind, mind or downfall or setback. And then, and then they would give me an argument for that, right? And I would say, I would say okay, so which one would you choose, right? And then so, and so usually they would say, right, because, right, because it makes sense. And I would say, okay, you have, you have this whole list of things. You have argument, 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 B, conclusion, that you should make a decision, that you right, right? How are you going to act? Yeah, so they would say, okay, I will certainly not act on my decision. And then I would ask, so if you fail, fail, right? Do you have this kind of reaction, action? And they would say, say, no, no, I would be able to do that about it because I would be really, really able to do it. Because, because I now I know that you have a or a score of sexual action. Is it possible? And I would I would actually act in this study. So I would say, you know, what it kind of sucks. So I wish I wish it better, better. better. Uh, I wish if I were better, maybe I wish it was a little harder, right? But I would have to have time to accept it. So now, so now I imagine that he says that and it goes all goes all well. And now they're all of a sudden, you know, kind of maybe going into extra, beating themselves up, right? And now we're now we're making. So now so you would now wait for them to calm down for them to some extent and for some time, and then you would go back to that same conversation. You'd say, okay, give me your argument. You're pretty much behaving in a way that indicates you believe in absolute perfection. Right? Why? Why? If if I'm looking if I'm looking a little weird, is my hit, my my sound is going really wonky here. This is a Zoom moment. Oh, for me. I mean, my I, sound was going really wonky there, and I'm I'm trying to switch my input, um, but it. Let, I, I probably missed some of that, but I, I do know where I want to help us go. Uh, and I want to sh give a shout out that someone said uh, in the chat said, thank you for that beautiful explanation of hope just a while ago. Um, so, so often, though, you know, you talked about the, the multi potentiality that some people have. And so many of our gifted kids do have that multi potentiality. They have that they they are so good at so many things. And it goes back to a question that you asked quite a while ago, or an issue in existential thinking that you that you mentioned at the beginning. And it's how do I know my purpose? What 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 kind of direction can you give us there? Because sometimes you know I'm 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 with the students, and they literally are kind of frozen in that, especially you know teenagers and high school students. Like there's so many things that I can do. Yep. Do I even know that I'm in, going in the right direction? And how do I know that? Right. OK, so I would take this from general to specific. So what I mean by that is the first question I would ask is, is there an objective purpose? And if there is, how do you know? So these, this is how usually these conversations go. I mean, obviously, it's not the same across the board. But like give or take, relatively, this is the majority. Right. So again, general to specific. So we ask, okay, well, how do you know that there's a purpose in life? Does this actually, you know, does the idea behind an objective purpose make sense? Most of the time, people agree that no, there really is no objective purpose. What does that mean? I should probably stop beating myself up for not having one, right? Because there is nothing given to us. Nobody sort of come down. I mean, obviously, unless you subscribe to uh, Judaism, nobody has come down Mount Sinai and has given us, you know, the sort of the tablets and said, OK, this is what you're supposed to do. Right. So you can kind of give yourself a break. It's not your fault that there's no objective purpose and you're kind of aimless. It's OK. You're a human being. So that's the general aspect of it. Right. And you could even talk about existential freedom and even mention that most people struggle with finding purpose. Or I would say creating purpose, because the idea is it's such a difficult task, because, again, there's no objective blueprint for it. So, again, you can kind of be easy on yourself and maybe even you can share a personal story and say, hey, you know, back, you know, let's say when I was in my 20s or, you know, whatever, even sometimes 30s, 40s, I was struggling with this, too. This is a human quality to struggle with creating a sense of meaning. So then specific. What we're talking about when we're going into the specific domain is essentially what are your values? What's important to you, right? What do you think about when you think of a good life? Uh, let's say, and sometimes people struggle with this, and I promise you it happens all the time. They're like, I don't know, right? Well, like, okay, what makes you happy now, right? What do you look forward to? And then they might say, well, you know, I really look forward to spending time with my friends. Um, I really love my wife, and I look forward to spending time with her. I love my pets, right? I love, uh, let's say, maybe my children, 
Um, I love, let's say if I, uh, if I'm a teacher, right. I love teaching. If I, you know, a volunteer worker, I love doing that. So the idea is that people always have values. So interestingly enough, uh, I don't want to get like too deep into this because I could go on a whole rant, but philosophy is implicit in everyone's life. I think this is the thing that people don't understand or don't know. So when people think of philosophy, they're like, oh, I don't want to sit there and like read about like Plato's forms or whatever. And like what else exists in, you know, these metaphysical realms. Okay. That's only a small subsection of what philosophy has to offer. So when we're thinking philosophically we're literally also asking ourselves how should i live what is important to me so even though again we might not know objective well not objectively we might not know um let's say when we kind of automatically like when we start thinking about it but the thing is we do have values and we live based on them or by them every single day of our lives so once you start exploring these values then what you're exploring is do they make you happy right or at the very least do they make you feel like your life is significant does it make you feel like you matter to the people around you does it feel like your actions have purpose does it feel like pretty much like they impact and influence other people um does it feel like for other people they see you in the same light you know, give or take, I mean, it's never going to be perfect, but do they see you in the same light that, you know, you kind of see yourself? Do they also think that you're important, right? So if the answer to all of these questions is sort of affirmative and you have a kind of set of values behind it, then the idea is that you're actually living a good life, right? You might want more and that's okay. I understand that maybe you want a different career or maybe you want to make more money. Cool, right? That's fine. But what we're looking for more so than anything is a starting point. And that starting point is what is it to be good enough? So if let's say we agree that nobody's perfect, which we already have, right? And human beings on top of that would probably say that nobody dies without regret. I'm not really sure that that's a possibility. I'm, I don't know of any human being. I've never heard anything where a person's on their deathbed is like, yep, I just lived this great life. And then I'm like, wow, I could have even died earlier because I've already accomplished everything I wanted to. <laughs> you know, that just doesn't happen. So if that's the case, and if people die with regret anyway, then the idea there is that, that it's okay to have a good enough, a sort of barrier for what it means or a kind of measuring stick for what it, or measuring enough, a measure for what it means to live a good enough life. And by the way, usually people already do live good enough lives. Black and white thinking tells them that they don't because they're kind of stuck in this dichotomy. What they're thinking is like, oh, because I don't have any of these things, right? Now I'm here. I'm on the other side. I'm unhappy. If I have all of these things, then I'm going to be happy. If I don't, I'm going to continue being miserable. But usually when people look at their values and the way they've been living, sometimes what you'll get is people are like, you know what? I haven't been living. I haven't been true to myself. I haven't been living authentically. You do sometimes get that. But 99% of the time, people are like, you know what? I have a pretty good life. Like, yeah, I love, you know, okay, I might not be a CEO or whatever. I might not be a manager somewhere. But yeah, I have a loving home. I come home to a spouse who really cares about me. I have kids who seem to really like value me and respect me. These are all really wonderful things. So why that's good is if a person is thinking about their values and purpose, again, cynicism and nihilism. You want to, as best as you can, keep them away from, you know, life has no meaning. Uh, if I don't get these things, I'll never, I'm never going to be happy. I'm never going to get these things. You want to kind of keep them away from that because again, black and white thinking is really useless. So, I mean, I'm sure there are some contexts where they could be helpful in this one. It's certainly not. So when we're thinking about creating a meaning, right? It's more so along the lines of like thinking of building on the meaning that you've already created. Again, some people do want to start from scratch. That certainly happens and that's absolutely okay. It takes a lot of time and it's more work, but it, it's fine. Right? I mean, it does happen. It's a part of being human. You're because a lot of times you're constantly recreating yourself anyway, to some extent. So it might just be a broader or a deeper form of it. But the point is that, yeah, usually people, when they start introspecting, they're like, wow, you know what? If I had to think about like the things that are important to me and how I'm living my life, I would say I'm a decent person and that's okay. So one of the things I really love about uh, this field and gifted education is that we start talking about giftedness and we start talking about gifted kids and we end up learning about ourselves in the process and these same questions that we should be asking ourselves and not only how to guide kids, but how to guide ourselves. So thank you for that. Uh, You're welcome. We have a question uh, from the chat and it is in teachers trainings, how do I deal with teachers that are always asking for perfection in the students work? Okay, so great question, but just to be clear, I am not a teacher and I do not have yeah. an academic background in teaching. So I just wanna say that's my caveat here. So I could just tell you what I would do in terms of therapy. And that would be going back into the dis distinctions between absolute and relative perfectionism and perfection and sort of ask like, okay, what is it? What, how is it that you, know, you think you're, or how is it that if you're demanding perfection, first of all, how is it that you're demanding perfection? Are you sort of asking for them to grow exponentially or are you pretty much asking them to grow gradually? Right. And I think that's a huge distinction to make. And so, and if the question is, let's say, 
if the question is, if, or if the answer, I'm sorry, if the answer is, well, I, I want them to grow exponentially, then you would say, okay, but how is that really possible? Because you're asking them to be perfect now and everything, obviously, because you want them to be perfect students. But if we're talking about reality and relative perfection, and again, remember evolution, right? We are adapting to our environment. And the only way that those kids can be perfect, if that's even possible, obviously the answer is probably no, but if they can be perfect, I mean, the answer is it has to come gradually and there's just, you have to be patient with that. I guess I would add as an educator, that if you're expecting perfection, then you're not actually teaching anything. If they've actually, if they've got it and they can maintain it, then you might as well go away because your job is done and you will never be useful again. And so, you know, and, and it was, it's a, you've written a blog too about uh, cognitive grit and resilience and, and, and that topic too. And, and, uh, but we're, we've been 35, 36 minutes into it already. I knew this was going to go fast. I knew this was going to go fast, but um, I want to get to a question that that may have uh, popped up in, in people's minds. I would say 100% uh, chance that it's popped up in the past 18 months. Um, it's tough times. It's tough times, and I and and I would think that uh, there's probably nothing like a pandemic to spur a lot of existential thinking, right. and I, I know that it has for myself. And how can we nurture those sorts of questions and, and fears uh, in our children and ourselves um, through this lens of existentialism? Yeah, so by asking a lot of great questions, so especially ones that are pertinent to all of us as human beings. So especially when we're talking about the pandemic, you, you just thought about asking about feelings. So how do you feel about what's going on? What does this all mean to you? Does this make sense? Or does it seem kind of absurd? And then maybe go into why life is a lot of times, you know, really absurd, that no matter how much order human beings try to impose on it, ultimately, I mean, it is pretty chaotic. And it's at least to a, a great extent, not fully, obviously, but to a great extent, it's unpredictable. So having, so having great dialogues and asking a lot of questions and also being vulnerable and saying like, hey, no, I have the same fears that you do. And this actually scares the crap out of me too. So can I ask you, Mark, what would you say? I am curious. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, I, I, I think I would, I would think I would try to identify with that and just be honest that, you know, I don't, I don't feel completely safe myself. And, uh, but that doesn't, that doesn't mean that you know, something bad's going to happen. And, and if something bad happens to us or something bad happens to the people around us, you know, well, we're going to come together because that's what we do. Yeah. And, and we support each other. I, I think that's where I would go. I love that. With yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and the sense of community, I think, is really important, whether you're religious or not, because I think everybody, it, death is, I think, terror. I mean, I know, I can't even say I think, I think we all know this, that death is terrifying, no matter what your denomination is, whether you do kind of like your religious, spiritual, whatever it is. And yet, I think the community, the sense of it is really important, because the idea is that, again, even though there's this distance between you and I, that you and I will never be sort of fused together as one. And in some sense, I have to go through this all alone. I actually also don't, because people can be there for me, and they can help me, and they could soothe me and soothe me and then let me know essentially that, yeah, we're going through the same things too. And it sucks. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, wow. That was pretty intense, sir. <laughs> and I, I really appreciate it. I really appreciate your insight. And uh, uh, it's not, it's not something that we don't often go there, right. In our dinner conversations. Yeah. And uh, it's so fun to go there and go there with, I know that uh, we're going there with the, with the right crowd, <laughs> that people are really listening out there. And so thank you so very much. Um, I'll come back and thank you again in just a minute, but everybody before you go here, I wanna remind you of a couple things here that uh, recordings are available at coloradogifted.org. And next week, we're going to have Brendan Mahan, uh, and he's going to be talking about rejection sensitivity. And he'll talk about what rejection sen sensitivity is, the signs of rejection sensitivity, and how it plays out in relationships. And I promise you, because uh, I've heard Brendan before, I promise you this will be another one that will possibly apply to the children you teach, love, or live with, and, but it will also possibly apply to yourself. Uh, Leon, last thing here, last thing, just uh, thank you again 
Thank you for taking time for us. And everybody, you, uh, it's in the chat, Leon's Existential Cafe. We didn't get to some great topics that he's blogged about in there. And I'd urge you to go, go out. And uh, you also have a podcast, right? Yeah. Oh, thank you so much for that. Yeah. So seize the moment podcast. And you could find us pretty much wherever podcasts are found, including YouTube. And you can find us at hiphop24.com. And that's H-I-P-H-O-P-X-X-I-V.com. All right. So thank you very much once again. And everybody, same time next week. We'll see you back here. Thank you so much. Bye.